At the beginning of the universe, all atoms in existence possessed only one, two, and very rarely, three protons. Over eons, gravity brought these atoms together, and via extreme pressure and heat, they fused in the cores of the first stars, creating larger elements. But this fusion can only squeeze about 26 protons together in a nucleus, producing iron. When we look at a periodic table, this is but a small portion of all of the elements in existence. What happened? Iodine and selenium, although trace elements in the human body, are critical for our existence. Entire technologies are based around the availability of rare earths like neodymium and lanthanum used in magnets and batteries. One thing that unites these heavy elements is their comparative rarity, leading some, like silver, gold, and platinum, to be prized above others. But where do these elements come from? Why are they so rare? The most prevalent pop science explanation for their origins are supernovae. Although this is not incorrect, it is misleading and underexplained. It is often implied that since the cores of stars can only get hot and dense enough to form iron, we simply need hotter and denser medium to fuse heavier elements. This is solved thanks to the extreme heat and pressure of supernovae. But elements heavier than iron, especially the more massive ones, aren't formed from fusion. In fact, temperatures hotter than those needed to fuse iron produce photons with enough energy to fragment and split these atoms into smaller ones. So hotter and denser environments are actually counterproductive to the creation of heavier elements. Instead, these elements are formed from a much more interesting mechanism called neutron capture. Before we discuss neutron capture, we should discuss the role of neutrons in atom nuclei. Nuclei are held together by the strong nuclear force. Both neutrons and protons can attract one another through this force, but protons repel each other and neutrons are less stable than protons. This means the most stable nucleus we can create is a combination of protons and neutrons. Let's look at an example. If we were to merge two protons together forming helium, both protons simultaneously repel and attract each other. The strong nuclear force is significantly stronger than this Coulomb repulsion, but even still, this intense repulsion prevents the di proton to achieve any state of stability. Immediately after fusing, one of the protons will decay into a neutron. This is now more stable because the attractive force between the new neutron and proton remains while also eliminating the repulsive force. If we add another nucleon, either neutron or proton, we add another source of attraction which helps hold the nucleus together. But if the added particle was a proton, then we add an additional source of repulsion. If it's a neutron, we add a less stable member. In the case of helium-3, this repulsive force is acceptable and so helium-3 is stable. But tritium is a bit less stable and will decay into helium-3 after about 12 years. Adding either a neutron or proton contributes some negative stabilizing factor, which requires interactions with the other nucleon to counteract. If we were to plot the proton-neutron ratios of the most common isotopes for each element, we would see that they tend to stick to this 1 to 1 ratio in the lower mass region. But as masses increase, this ratio skews towards a larger number of neutrons, following what is known as a line of stability. Why is that? This occurs because the strong nuclear force that holds nucleons and nuclei together only acts over a very short distance, whereas the Coulomb repulsion felt by the protons extends over the entire nucleus. That means a proton is strongly attracted to all of its immediate neighbors, but repulsed by every other proton in the nucleus. As nuclei get bigger, each additional proton increases the amount of repulsion every other proton experiences. We can mitigate this repulsion and increase stability by adding more neutrons. Adding neutrons is easier to do for larger nuclei, as the amount of instability a single neutron adds to it becomes less and less significant. Where in tritium, an additional neutron was a 100% increase in neutrons and their respective instability, 
Adding a neutron to a nuclei with 50 neutrons represents only a 2% increase in neutrons. The larger a nucleus gets, the easier it is to just slap more neutrons onto it. And conversely, the harder it gets to add more protons. This ability to easily add extra neutrons to large elements is the backbone of neutron capture and the mechanism for creating larger elements. Neutron capture can occur either slowly or rapidly, the difference being how fast neutrons are added. For slow capture, neutrons are added slower than the decayed lifetimes of the new isotopes. Capture events occur on intervals of 10 to 100 years. So, after a capture, if the current isotope is unstable, there is typically a decay before the next capture event. This increases the number of protons in the nucleus and creates a heavier element. This slow addition of neutrons can occur if nuclei or elements find themselves in an environment with free neutrons floating around, like the fusing regions of giant stars. Because neutrons are added so slowly, S process elements always have a ratio of protons to neutrons that hovers around the line of stability. It is theorized that iron formed from older generations of stars, which then exploded, usually from type 1 supernovae, are the seeds for much larger elements. The iron can condense along with gases to form a new star, or simply fall into the nearby donor star where it remains trapped. While trapped, nuclei slowly accumulate neutrons and increase in mass as the star carries on with its life. These large elements are then ejected back into the cosmos via stellar winds. In the early cosmos that flourish with countless stars organized in globular clusters, these heavy element-enriched media were easily pulled into new stars yet again, repeating the process and continuing to grow. The second mechanism for neutron capture is the rapid process. This is when atoms are bombarded with neutrons, accumulating dozens and dozens of neutrons producing bizarre and highly unstable nuclei. These nuclei will then decay on a longer time scale back towards the line of stability. Each neutron that decays produces a new proton and thus a heavier element. In order to bombard nuclei with so many neutrons, the rapid process can only occur in environments with incredibly high neutron densities. The two most likely candidates for these locations are the neutron-rich cores of supernovae and the neutron-pure environments of a binary star merger, also known as a kilonova. The neutron-dense environments created during these events make neutron accumulation an almost inevitability, the only uncertainties being if the newly formed atoms will be able to escape the intense gravitational field formed in the aftermath and the frequency of their occurrence throughout the history of the universe. However, we expect the rate of neutron star mergers will follow the history of star formation in galaxies, with a few hundred million or so year delay for those stars to die and spiral into each other. In a galaxy like the Milky Way, this means that peak R process production by neutron star mergers should have occurred about 10 to 11 billion years ago and tapered off to a rate about 10 times less in the present day as star formation diminishes. Despite supernovae occurring with far greater frequency than neutron star mergers, models suggest the latter is actually the source for the majority of large elements in our galaxy. Recently, spectrographic analysis from the James Webb Space Telescope monitoring a likely neutron star merger detected an emission line characteristic of tellurium, or a heavy R process element. Similar evidence was only observed once before in 2017, where the afterglow of the infrared spectra from a kilonova was characteristic of other R process elements. We are starting to find evidence to confirm what models have predicted. Neutron star mergers take time to occur. The gravitational decay is exceptionally weak, requiring hundreds of millions of years before they finally connect. When we look at the oldest stars in our galaxy, we find evidence for some large R process elements, existing too soon to have been formed by a neutron star merger. Even though it's theoretically quite difficult to produce large amounts of these R process elements via supernovae, they likely produced some. Models suggest that fast-spinning, highly magnetized hypernovae K2 
can produce a modest amount of these large elements, and these may have been the source for some produced early on. But the evidence is trending towards most of our heaviest rare earth elements forming during Kilinova events. The last thing to discuss are the caveats of these two processes. Although I did say one can easily add neutrons to larger elements, this is an oversimplification. Much like the electrons that surround the nucleus, the nucleus itself is composed of shells or energetic layers dictated by the Pauli principle. That is to say, each nucleon in a nucleus must have a unique quantum state. Once you fill one of these shells, filling the next requires a little more energy. Electron shells are easily identifiable on the periodic table. They are the noble gases. These represent completely full electron shells. If you wish to add another electron, you must do so in a new, larger volume. If we were to look at the total number of electrons in each shell, we'd see that they follow this sequence. 2, 10, 18, 36, 54, and 86. Nucleons also adhere to this shell filling. However, the numbers required to fill their shells differ, and that sequence of numbers is seen here. These are referred to as magic numbers, and they represent local maxima of stability. Adding an extra neutron or nucleon to a filled shell will cause a disproportionate drop in average binding energy per nucleon. For S-process elements, it's a bit harder to add an additional neutron once reaching a magic number. If we were to plot the abundance of isotopes in our solar system, we would see an interesting pattern. Instead of the expected continual drop in abundance with size, we actually have this up and down motion with peaks. This peak represents strontium and a neutron shell of 50. This peak is barium and a neutron shell of 82. And this last guy is lead with a neutron shell of 126. These peaks exist because if you continue to add neutrons, you will eventually reach a magic number. Now it's harder to add more, so elements with full neutron shells accumulate. The same thing happens during the R process with a slight difference. When an S-process nucleus fills its neutron shell, there is a stable or proportional amount of protons. However, during the R process, since these neutrons are added faster than they can decay, when a neutron shell is filled, there are fewer protons than an S-process nucleus with the same amount of neutrons. This means the nucleus is very unstable and neutrons will start to decay, turning into protons. And since the number of protons was fewer to begin with, the total mass of this nucleus is less. So for R process elements, their peaks are shifted a bit to the left of the S process peaks because they have less mass. To recap, large elements are not formed by fusion. This is partly because the extreme temperatures required to do so would produce photons with enough energy to fragment those larger elements. The larger a nucleus gets, the less destabilizing it is to add a neutron, and so it gets easier to add more neutrons. This addition of neutrons can be done either slowly or rapidly. Neutrons being added slowly to elements suspended in stars, and neutrons being added rapidly during neutron star mergers and, to a lesser extent, supernovae. These newly added neutrons can then decay into protons, creating new and larger elements. Slow process neutrons will build up until reaching a magic number, at which point it gets harder to add another. This is seen in the isotopic abundance of the elements in the solar system. Our process neutrons also do this, but because they have less protons than nuclei built with the S process, they have less mass and so their peaks are to the left of the S process peaks. Mm -hmm.